What makes a good Super Smash Bros. boss? Well, no surprise here, the answer is about as subjective as the games they come from. The series has seen iterations outlining every Nintendo generation since the N64, and there's undoubtedly been a myriad of changes with each new installment. So, just as each new version brings along its own brand of party brawler fun, the boss designs changed quite a bit with the times. And while it might be easy to write off the whole conversation and just claim the newest examples are the best, I think there's a lot more to think critically about here. Actually, I'd argue that just like there's some feature or quirk to love in each of these games, they all serve up an impressive flavor of boss fights worth studying. So today, just as the fifth game of Ultimate is starting to enter the scene, I think it'd be worthwhile to discuss the highs and lows of the series' boss fights. Hey all you four glory champions, I'm Skip the Tutorial, and this is Boss Battle Breakdown, a deep dive into the ins and outs of boss design. And hey, if this is your first time here, then Falcon Punch that subscribe for weekly insights into your favorite boss fights. For starters, just like you'd kick off any good match of Smash Bros, we need to talk about the stage. If you ask me, a solid boss battle for this series has to be brave enough to experiment with the level design. For example, let's take a peek at this boss encounter with Meta Ridley in Super Smash Bros Brawl's Subspace Emissary Mode. While your unlikely squad of characters makes a break for it out of the bomb factory, you're treated to an unwelcome greeting from the space pirate himself, as he's dead set for revenge on none other than Samus and Pikachu. Your next two minutes now become a mad dash out of the doomed facility, all the while being chased down by a vengeful space dragon. So as you select your characters to fight and start working away at the boss's health, his attacks are fairly standard for the earlier parts of the section. But the real ramp up of this fight comes from when the enemy switches his focus right from you and instead to the getaway vehicle. From here, now you have to balance a proper damage output on Ridley to ultimately end the fight. On top of avoiding any falls to your death while he rocks your ship every which way to Sunday. And do every single bit here under the pressure of the time limit. It's intense, and it really does add a satisfying blend between the boss and your environment. Forcing the player to consistently keep on their toes. That concept in particular is pretty great. Since so much of the series core design, and especially its praise, comes down to the speed and movement efficacy that's highlighted in the mechanics. Therefore, a stage design that emphasizes this aspect into the fight delivers a compelling back and forth for the player to consider. Plus, giving this level of depth to the arena fleshes out a greater amount of memorable aspects for players to connect with here, which admittedly plays in stark contrast to just fighting another baddie on the floating platform at Final Destination. The difference there coming down to a fighting emphasis or more of a mix like we see in Meta Ridley's Brawl, which in my preference, that blend really fits in with the greater mechanics of Smash, and makes for a pretty slick sequence. Next up on the docket, we need to talk about health bars. More specifically, they gotta be included in these fights. I'll admit, I went back and forth on my thoughts with their inclusion for these battles. The percentage is such an iconic staple for the series, and not having that crossover is a bit strange, especially by my philosophy of theme cohesion in these battles. Despite this, looking to the execution of this concept within the series' bosses makes dropping that theory a whole lot easier. First, let's reverse back to the series' roots in Smash Bros. 64, and see how the battles were handled there. You see, in the classic mode for the original title, it standardized this pattern of giant and metal versions of other fighters that would become commonplace for these adventure modes. And with their attributes, these brawlers also adhered to that same percentage gravity system you'd see in Smash Bros. Face Off. So you get these weightier fights with foes like Donkey Kong that don't feel all too different from your typical CPU match, but frame this against your fight with Master Hand in the same game. Here, the glove switches out the typical knock-them-off-the-screen style we're used to, and instead offers up a health bar system. This slight change offers up its own interesting ramifications, as now your goal is much more streamlined to each hit you land. Moreover, this also keeps the fight to close quarters, since now you'll be the one pinballing about the stage with each blow. This shift incentivizes the player to mad dash attacks on your foe when he's nearby, and makes sure that you feel it each time he pulls away for his own telegraph. Your focus locks in on each opportunity to shave down a few more hit points, hopefully with some bigger attacks, instead of a potential optimal strategy with the other system of just puffing up your opponent's damage counter with cheap shots. And as the timer closes down, the health bar's constant reminder will drive you to squeeze every last drop of pain onto that foe. Heading full steam from 1999 to 2001, the biggest takeaway I see from Melee's boss design is the absolute thrill of taking a simultaneous team of bosses. First showcased in the Metal Mario and Metal Luigi face-off. The classic pairing that truly sticks out from the series to me lies in Master Hand and Crazy Hand. The reason I love the balancing act in this fight comes down to another key part of Smash's exemplary design, its role as a party fighting game. Because of this distinction, a lot of the moveset designs within the series relate back to the concept of crowd control and wide range attacks. 
So from this, getting to utilize these various skills and techniques against your foes feels like busting out another side of your toolbox. Staggering the enemy team's health bars can also bring out some of the emergent decisions we discussed earlier in brilliant ways. For example, do you work your way through the higher HP target of Crazy Hand and leave the easier other half for the finish up? Or would you rather eliminate the controlled side's laser-centric attacks for more room to take down Crazy? The constant switch-ups you'll be making as you hop back and forth between the two bosses in the fights creates a strikingly memorable experience, as well as giving you the premier satisfaction of walking out of a 2v1 the victor. And while each of these aspects are necessary within their own right, I'd personally place the concept of variety above the rest in a Smash Bros. boss. To showcase what I mean by this, we can switch gears over to Smash 4's addition to the classic mode tradition, Master Core. Now, any Smash veteran who's played through this fight on the 9.0 difficulty knows exactly the hectic playstyle this beast throws in the mix. Starting off as its Master Giant form, this swarm monster will take on a whole slew of different looks depending on your difficulty, including the agile jumping of the Master Beast, the onslaught fury of the Master Edges, and then wrapping up the traditional brawl with a Master Shadow clone of your character. What's beautiful about each of these phases is that they each bring a punishing set of thematic attacks that randomly pair for your destruction. Obviously worth noting here is that this is an extreme example of the variety that works in these fights. But taken in tandem with the clear love and affection constantly put into packing these games to the brim, I'd say it makes these battles, and particularly these concluding fights, into proper wrap-ups of all the manic craziness you faced before the showdown. And I mean no ill will when I say this, it's just so weird. But that's why it's such a perfect design philosophy for the Smash series. A franchise that's more than willing to lean into the bizarre and wacky world of crossovers and come out on top to deliver a slick experience. So with all that said, what really makes a good Smash Bros. boss? Well, in my opinion, a great fight for this series has to be ready and willing to play with its stage layout to drive home these themes of mobility. It should absolutely feature a health bar incentive for the player to gauge and strategize their style within the fight, and give this party brawler the proper multiple character mayhem it's been synonymous with for years. Most of all, I'm giving a full send to the devs to create the weirdest and wackiest boss designs they've ever dreamt of. Because in a series chock full of gaming's best and craziest ideas, it's only fitting that these battles showcase that idea, through and through. Oh, and it should also be playable on the Switch. You know what that means, Ultimate. The ball's in your court. Now it's time to show us your moves. Hey there. Hope you enjoyed the Smash-themed boss battle breakdown. I've got a feeling Ultimate's gonna make sure it's not the last, so wavelength on the subscribe to stay up to date on that. Feel free to up B on this one in the top right to see why Paper Mario Color Splash's bosses didn't make the mark or taunt down in the bottom right for another video. Until then, take care, and you have a good one, alright?